We're very thankful that Brother Doug McClish was willing to take on this assignment. And I know that Brother Charles would be happy that he'd be the one to do it. But I'm even more happy than that that he was able to do it. it we kind of come expecting to maybe have to fill in at times. You don't know. You get this many people together, people will be sick, various things. We're grateful that, that Dub will be able to do this. Uh, Dub's a native Texan. He's a gospel preacher, a son-in-law of a gospel preacher, the father of a gospel preacher, the grandson of an elder. And his beloved wife, LaVon, who passed away on January 5th, was a native Tennessean, daughter of the late B.B. and Mildred James. Three children, one daughter. And they have, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to locate the granddaughters here. Well, anyway, he's got grandchildren and great-grandchildren. <laughs> let's let it go with that. Um, he attended the schools at Burnett, Texas and Boise, Idaho. And after three years of high school, he completed a three-year Bible major at Freed Hardeman College, Henderson, 54 to 57, received his B.A. degree, uh, Bible major and music minor from Abilene Christian College, a different school altogether than exists now, 1959, and has done some graduate study. He's done local preaching in Emmett, Idaho, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, Louisville, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky, and Carlsbad, New Mexico, Wichita Falls, um, Iowa, is that right? Iowa Park, I mean, San Antonio. San Angelo, Granbury, and, and Denton, the Pearl Street Congregation, and now at the North Point Congregation. Uh, I might announce that if you don't know it, they, they got a new building here not long ago, and we're grateful that they were able to do that and should further the work in giving a good place for them to meet. Done evangelistic work all over the world and written for so many different things and written directed lectureships and we're familiar with a great amount of that as well as being a founding editor of the Gospel Journal. His editorship of that was truly a breath of fresh air from what uh, has come recently f from certain ones. We won't go into more than that but he's been very active in his 70 years on the earth <laughs> and uh, always Try, I'll never be as tall as he is, but he's just about nine years older than me, and I try to look ahead into the future when I look at him. But I love him, and I appreciate him, and wish him the best in his work. Would you come speak to us, Brother Doug? I'd like for everyone to turn to Leviticus chapter 19, verse 32, to begin with tonight. <clears throat> and while you're doing that, I'll recommend highly the chapter Brother Charles Pogue has in our book. I hope you will read it. It's very good material. I will not be following that material, <clears throat> but you'll get uh, double whammy on this subject tonight, I guess. I must say a word of appreciation to the congregation here uh, in connection with our building at North Point. Uh, David mentioned it, and the uh, congregation here was extremely generous toward our efforts to purchase that property, and uh, we are enjoying it immensely. We've already uh, torn out two walls inside and enlarged and remodeled it and getting ready for Danny Douglas's meeting coming up uh, beginning the last Sunday of March, Lord willing. And uh, I know I speak for all of our folks at North Point in saying those few words of thanks. Jesus came as a great unifier both between God and men and between Jew and Gentile. Paradoxically, but not in a contradictory way, he came as a great divider. And so he warned the apostles and by principle warns us, Matthew 10, verse 34, think not that I came to send peace upon the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. 
Now we understand that there is an ellipsis in that statement as there is in a, a number of uh, statements in the New Testament. What the Lord is saying is, think not that I came only to send peace, but also a sword. Those are not contradictory. In fact, the one sometimes causes the other or results from the other. The subject of unity and fellowship are uh, related. Unity has to do with uh, oneness, with that which is undivided. Uh, two or more persons or entities that have been uh, combined in a harmonious way. Perhaps an excellent definition of it would be found in Paul's exhortation to the Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10, when he besought them that they be perfectly joined together in the same mind, the same spirit, that there be no divisions among them. That's unity. Fellowship has to do with uh, a relationship between two or more parties in which those uh, parties share and jointly participate in one or more things. And this relationship of fellowship inheres between deity and mankind and between human beings and between congregations of human beings. Did the Lord have anything to say about errors relating to these subjects of unity and fellowship? Well, indeed, he spoke many words that explicitly or implicitly relate to both of them. Let's think about unity first and what the Lord said about it. One passage I'm sure comes to our minds immediately, and that is his prayer recorded in John chapter 17. The first part of his prayer, he prays concerning himself, the restoration of his glory. The second part of his prayer is addressed to his apostles. Those, he says, whom thou hast given me. And in verse 11, he says, Holy Father, keep them in thy name, which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are. And the third section of his prayer relates to us, to all of those, he says, who will hear the words of the apostles. And so in verses 20 and 21, neither for these, the apostles, only do I pray, but for them also that believe on me through their word, that they may all be one, even as thou, Father, art in me and I in thee, that they also may be in us, that the world might believe that thou didst send me. An observation or two from this section of the prayer. The denominations, of course, like to take this and uh, apply it to themselves, and I've heard a number of brethren apply it to the denominational divisions. It applies to denominations only in a secondary sense, because those who hear the words of the apostles do not become members of denominations. <laughs> Those who hear the words of the apostles in the sense of being obedient to them become simply Christians. The Lord is praying for every generation of those who will obey the gospel of Christ and be added to the church that they may be one. Now there is an implication behind this prayer. The Lord apparently is thinking that that's going to be difficult to achieve and it will not always be possible to achieve. But he expresses fully his earnest desire that that might be uh, so. So we know that the Lord desires for his people to be unified. Jesus implies then that unnecessary division will be a deterrent to evangelism that the world might believe that thou didst send me. This is one of his motives for praying for unity among his people. 
Did Jesus have much to say on the subject of fellowship? Well, we might think it's strange that he never uses the word fellowship in any of the recorded words we have from him. But by implication, he has much to say on the subject. We could just confine ourselves to the Sermon on the Mount and have much material uh, to observe. Chapter 5, verses 11 and 12, he speaks of persecution. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are ye when men shall reproach you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so persecuted they the prophets that were before you. Do you think he uh, was in fellowship with or that he expected his persecuted people to be in fellowship with the persecutors and the reproachers? I think not. In the fifth chapter, verses 13 through 15, he says, Ye are the light of the world, ye are the salt of the earth. Does he not imply that uh, the salt and the light, his people here, are not in fellowship with the world? <laughs> that uh, the salt and light are to affect. In uh, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, he assails uh, the hypocritical worshipers. Does he not imply that uh, he and his faithful followers will not be in fellowship with those who make a pretense out of worshiping God when actually they're worshiping themselves? In chapter 6, verse 24, those who serve the wrong master. No man can serve two. You'll hate one, love the other, cleave to one, despise the other. You cannot serve God in mammon. Is God, is Christ in fellowship with the mammon of this world, with all the material forces that exist within it and the hold that those forces have upon men? Indeed not. In chapter 7, verses 13 and 14, the two roads, our ways, are set before us. The one that is the broad way, whose end is destruction. The other is a straightened or difficult way, whose end is life. Is there any fellowship between the broad way and the straightened way? Indeed, there is not. He is drawing a line of fellowship by implication. In verses 15 and 16, immediately following, beware, he says, of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravening wolves. By their fruits you shall know them. Was the Lord in fellowship with these false teachers about whom he was warning the apostles and warning all who would ever read these words down to this very moment? Most certainly not. When Jesus publicly exposed, rebuked, and refuted the scribes, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the Sadducees on various occasions figuratively tanning their hypocritical hides time after time, do you think he was in fellowship with them? Or that he was suggesting that his apostles might be in fellowship with them? Oh, he was warning about them, wasn't he? Jesus inspired writers who gave us the New Testament, simply expounded upon the basic principles that the Lord set forth in such passages as these we have noted as they wrote time and time again about fellowship and the restrictions of it, the conditions of it, the uh, exclusions and exclusions uh, having to do with it. And so our Lord, either in person or through his apostles, had much to say on fellowship. Fellowship with God and with his Son and with the Holy Spirit Fellowship with deity, we may say, is attained. It is not automatic. It is not unconditional. If it were unconditional, it would be universal. The fact that it is not universal demands that it be uh, conditional. It has qualifications or conditions attached to it. And in this thought is the entire scheme of redemption uh, wrapped up. Man sinned, he violated the law of God, became a sinner, and severed his fellowship with God in the very beginning of time. 
And ever since that day, every rational human being has fallen under the inclusive statement of Paul in Romans 3 and verse 23. For all have sinned, an aorist tense having to do with that which has occurred in the past, and fall short, a present tense term, which means are now falling short and continue to fall short of the glory of God. There will never be a human being that does not sin, is what Paul is saying, apart from the one exception of our Lord, of course. This means that all men, when they reach an age of accountability, all human beings, when they reach that accountable age, are alienated from God because they have by that time violated the law of God. They have become sinners. Fellowship could not be restored until some remedy for sin could be found. And it required blood in some form from someone the eternal principle is stated in Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. And particularly with the blood of the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1.29. And so the Lord offered up his blood as we sang in that beautiful song a few moments ago. On our behalf, on the behalf of every sinner who has ever lived and who is alienated from God. Sins could then be washed away in that perfect blood of the perfect Lamb. Upon a confessed faith in Christ that He is the resurrected Son of God, Romans chapter 10, verses 10 and 11, and upon one's repentance or turning from sin and his baptism into Christ for the remission of his sins, that blood cleanses the sinner and makes it possible for fellowship that had once been severed to be restored. Thus, the doctrine of reconciliation in the New Testament. Revelation 1.5 tells us that the blood of Christ washes away our sins. And Acts 22.16 tells us that it is in the act of baptism and not before that the blood does its cleansing washing. And so fellowship can be restored for any person who is willing to comply with these simple conditions that the Lord has set forth. He vested the power of his saving blood in the message of the gospel, Romans 1.16. It is the power of God unto salvation. And through its proclamation throughout the world, the Lord wants that message to go to every sinner that it can possibly reach. Each person upon obedience to that gospel message then is forgiven of his sins, saved by the Lord, added to his church, Acts 2 verse 47, translated into his kingdom, Colossians 1 verse 13, baptized into his body, 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 13. The church that Jesus built then is the depository of every saved person from the day of Pentecost until the end of the world, Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20. In God's Son alone is there the possibility of fellowship with man's creator. Fellowship restored. Well, fellowship uh, attained is not automatic, nor is fellowship maintained automatic. The fact that we say that fellowship must be maintained implies that it can be forfeited once it has been attained. There was a man by the name of John Calvin in the 16th century who came up with the doctrine that once you attain fellowship with God or salvation, you cannot forfeit it or lose it. There was another man named Jesus Christ in the first century who taught that you can forfeit your fellowship with God and you can lose it. Maintaining that fellowship depends upon our adherence faithfully to the word of God. As sin separates before we attain fellowship, it separates after we attain fellowship if we do not repent of it. 
One who denies this both deceives himself and implies that God is a liar, according to 1 John chapter 1, verses 8 and 10. If it is impossible for one to lose his fellowship with God once it is attained, we could dispense with or ignore most of the New Testament and not lose very much. You think just rapidly how much of the New Testament is devoted to beseeching, to begging, to uh, exhorting, to encouraging those who are God's people to remain God's people, to be faithful, to live in the way that God wills them to live. Jesus requires his disciples to be faithful even to the point of giving their lives up for his sake if called upon to do so, according to Revelation chapter 2 and verse 10. But there is more to fellowship than man's relationship to deity. There is the fellowship between man and man. We sometimes speak of these two distinctions as vertical fellowship, that between man and God, and horizontal fellowship, that between us and our fellow man. Biblical fellowship with others depends upon and flows from one's fellowship with God. John chapter 1 or 1 John chapter 1 verse 7 says, If we walk in the light as he, God, is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. The conditional clause means it, that uh, if we do not walk in the light, if we do not serve God faithfully, we cannot have fellowship with others who are serving God faithfully. So maintaining fellowship with disciples of the Lord depends upon maintaining fellowship with God, walking, continuing to walk in the light. Those in fellowship with God cannot maintain or remain in fellowship with those who are not in fellowship with Him. Now they may think they do, they may want to, they may act like they are, but it is not a biblical fellowship. Since biblical unity is the product of biblical fellowship, cessation of fellowship destroys unity between those who are God's people and the offenders. God consequently then can have no fellowship with those offenders, just as we cannot. Now a declared unity based on anything other than genuine biblical fellowship first the vertical and then the horizontal aspects of it, is a contrived fellowship it, or a unity. It is an artificial unity. It is simply a declared unity and is no unity at all, in fact. Now, there are two basic classes of errors concerning fellowship and unity. There are those who declare that optional things are obligatory for us to do. This is an error relating to fellowship and unity. It divides brethren. It is wrong. We commonly refer to it as anti-ism. We do not mean that as a derogatory term, but simply as an identification term that perhaps we can uh, understand. This error restricts the unity and fellowship of God's people. It closes it in and it fences others out with whom the Lord's people should be able to have fellowship. The 1950s was the heyday of this uh, error on fellowship and unity. And uh, it uh, operated on the legs of opposition to children's homes being supported by congregations and congregations cooperating with one another in evangelistic work. And then it uh, evolved into opposition to eating a meal in a church building and other aspects of it. While they uh, affected a percentage, an uh, unfortunate percentage of members of the church, 
back in those days, it has become somewhat of a stagnated movement. They uh, are a movement unto themselves. Uh, most of those brethren will not have any fellowship with uh, those of us who are here tonight. And it's unfortunate that that is so. Jesus confronted this error very directly. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 6, as he scored the uh, attitude and the actions of the scribes and the Pharisees by saying that they were insisting upon their tradition and thereby making void the word of God. Well, their tradition happened to be that you had to wash hands before you ate. Now, those of us who are parents probably trained our children to wash their hands before they ate. But I don't think we ever told them they were going to hell if they didn't. And that's what the scribes and Pharisees were doing. It was a matter of fellowship with them. They took something that was optional and said, no, you've got to do it. It's obligatory or you'll be lost. They thereby severed fellowship with anyone, including Jesus and his disciples, because they were complaining against the fact that Jesus' disciples did not wash their hands before they ate obviously didn't have fellowship with them. But the Lord says that is wrong. He corrected and confronted that error in a very direct way. Now the other basic error concerning fellowship and unity is on the opposite end of the spectrum. Those who declare that obligatory things, things we must do, are merely our choices or our options. And this uh, attitude is correctly identified as liberalism. It takes liberties with uh, things that God has specified. It gives the uh, uh, owner's uh, merchandise away, <laughs> things that do not belong to them, they give away. And just as the former error restricts fellowship and unity, this one enlarges fellowship and unity beyond the bounds of New Testament uh, allowance. This began arising in the late, uh, 1960s, mid-1960s perhaps, with uh, criticism of negative preaching and dogmatism in the pulpit, and uh, we've been emphasizing the plan too much. We need to emphasize the man, Christ, more, and such uh, catchphrases as these. So to these folks, such things as uh, what kind of music, instrumental or a cappella music, or uh, what day we uh, choose to observe the Lord's Supper, or the purpose of baptism, and other matters of this sort, those are matters of preference. Those are matters of uh, what we choose to do or say about them. I call uh, liberalism a light version of universalism or pluralism. It just hasn't quite gotten to the end of the road of universalism, but in attitude, it basically is of the same sort of uh, philosophy. These brethren are going strong and they're getting stronger. They've captured hundreds of congregations and many of the colleges associated with uh, the Lord's people and they're going to accomplish more of their dastardly work. The liberals in the days of Jesus, religiously speaking, were the Sadducees. They didn't believe in angels. They didn't believe in uh, uh, spirits, that is, that a man had a spirit. They uh, denied the resurrection. And the Lord had one confrontation with them that's uh, notably recorded in Matthew chapter 22. And they foolishly thought they had the Lord on the horns of a dilemma, and they ended up being gored by their own horns. And what he said to them is what we would say to every liberal, ye do err not knowing the scriptures. If they knew and believed the scriptures, they would not thus err. Perhaps uh, it's not altogether true that they don't know the scriptures, they just don't believe that God meant what he said in the scriptures. For the remainder of our time, I want us to look at some more specific current unity and fellowship errors now. 
First of these I want to mention is unity in diversity. Sometimes I hear it uh, incorrectly stated, unity and diversity, but it's unity in diversity, according to the author of it. I suppose the first brother that came up with this term to describe his uh, theological liberalism was uh, Carl Ketcherside in the late 1950s. And interestingly, his theological journey involved being a rabid anti against almost anything that you could think of, and then uh, rather dramatically and somewhat suddenly, at least it seemed, jumping to the other end of the theological spectrum of believing that almost no one was going to be lost. But one thing he did to try to get across his uh, theological program was to make a distinction between the gospel and the doctrine of Christ. And he said, when you obey the gospel, everyone who obeys the gospel is then in fellowship with one another. But he said, doctrine is different. You don't have to be in fellowship on doctrine, such things as how we worship or uh, the plan of salvation or uh, church government or marriage, divorce, and remarriage, things like that. that. Those things, differences of those kinds, don't destroy fellowship as long as you've obeyed the gospel. And of course, later on, he went further left from that, and it was just as long as you believe in Jesus. Uh, a liberal never stops, you know, in his evolution when he gets started. It's like the fellowship circle. Uh, it may start just a little bit larger than what the Lord has prescribed, but then it has a way of uh, spiraling more and more and embracing more and more people. And so it was with Ketcherside and his unity and diversity. And uh, most brethren paid little attention to him back then. The anti-movement was the big movement back then. So um, this was so far out and so radical that most thought that uh, nobody would uh, ever fall for it. But uh, believe it or not, they did. Rubel Shelley came along in the 1980s, and he practically picked up the same jargon that uh, Ketcherside was using. And he did so to justify his uh, extending fellowship to uh, denominational people. I can't believe that he's getting up here already. I may have to withdraw fellowship from him. <laughs> he came up with big F and little f fellowship. And it boiled down to the distinction between gospel and doctrine, basically speaking. Well, that's an error on fellowship and unity, of course, that uh, Jesus confronted and devastated, if nowhere else, by almost the closing words of the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 7, 21 through 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father who is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name, cast out demon in thy name? Do many mighty works in thy name. And I will profess unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. I believe that's a confrontation and answer to that very type of thinking. Well, I had another one or two here I wanted to mention, but I'll just mention one of them. This one I call uh, the error uh, certain false teachers don't have to repent. Certain false teachers don't have to repent error. Now one would think that such an error would uh, arise from the change agent types of Rubel Shelley and, and those types. But this doctrine has arisen in the past uh, seven years, since 2005, among those uh, once considered uh, strong in the faith and beside whom we stood on many a platform, beside which many of us uh, worked hand in hand with them in the truth and in fellowship and in unity for many years. But this all abruptly changed in 2005 when an entity called Apologetics Press was at risk for going under because it's uh, director had uh, been exposed 
and had to resign. A statement signed by 60 men in support of Apologetics Press was secured in order to try to keep it from folding up. And when its new director was announced, he turned out to be a brother who had been involved in false teaching and false practice in connection with that teaching and who had not repented of it and refused to do so, Brother Dave Miller. Now these brethren, some of the 60 who signed this statement of support, had formerly been opposing the things that Brother Miller had been teaching. But now, if they continued to oppose him, they would have to give up their support for Apologetics Press. So they were caught in a dilemma. Shall they give up their support of Apologetics Press in order to be consistent in opposing the errors of Brother Miller? Or shall they give up their opposition to error so they can support Apologetics Press? How lamentable that they chose the latter of those two options. And so they have decided that uh, at least there is one brother who does not have to repent of his sins in order to have their fellowship. And so Brother Miller has continued to circulate on uh, lectureships with a number of these brethren, glad hand to each other, they endorse him, they support him, they promote him, they defend him, and he has a free run among them. I do not know how these brethren rationalize their behavior. They have found some way to do so. I uh, cannot imagine how it is because I know that some of these men have written entire books on the subject of unity and fellowship. And I endorsed uh, a couple of those books back through the years, one by Brother Curtis Cates, another one by Brother Robert Taylor, where they taught the truth just as clearly as it can be taught on fellowship and unity but which now they have repudiated for the past seven years by their behavior. And it is very possible that they are still teaching the truth on this subject, but they refuse to practice it. I believe that the Lord had something to say about this error in confronting it. When Jesus was talking about the The people in Matthew chapter 7, I believe that uh, they would fit into that mold as well as uh, the way that uh, the others did that we mentioned, Catcher Side and, and uh, Rugal Shelley and some of the others. I cannot uh, see how the behavior of these men is uh, different in principle from the behavior of those who have made a distinction between gospel and doctrine are between big F fellowship and little f fellowship. They're just doing it on a different basis. The Lord surely cannot be pleased with that kind of bias, that kind of privileged treatment, that kind of partiality. We simply say this in closing, fellowship and the line of fellowship is the basic battleground in fighting the fight between truth and error. If we give up the fight on fellowship and where the Lord draws the line of fellowship, then the kingdom will be flooded with illegal aliens. The kingdom of Christ has border lines just as surely as our nation does. And it will be an even greater tragedy if all of the border lines of the Lord's kingdom are breached than it is that the borders of our own nation are breached. Let us remember that the Lord was very, very earnest in his interest about fellowship and unity.
again, we appreciate so much your efforts in this and helping us out. A fine lesson. I don't know why I was concerned about me moving up here. This is a lot softer seat, and that's the only reason I came up here early. <laughs> well, we've got about seven or eight minutes. Let's come back at the top of the hour for our last tonight, and we're thankful you're here and hope you'll stay. We're dismissed. <laughs>